um, you know, just a mixed bag of criticizing him, you know, people saying like he was sexually liberating and, you know, but no, you know, he wasn't, he was an abuser and all, and all that. And we're not going to, we're not going to talk about Harvey Weinstein, he's a <laughs> fucking pig, but, um, yeah, it's, <laughs> and, um, but what I learned about Hefner was that he got a lot of black comics going because he would hire black black comics to work in the Playboy in the Playboy clubs. So um, Samson McCormick, my very talented friend, is um, going to visit us one one of these times. And yeah, there's moms, there's moms, maybe maybe he's going to come talk to us about black comedians. Yeah, yeah. Man, he, he definitely on this show. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. gonna be nice. That's gonna be tight. Yeah, Samson. See, he will. Cause okay, we got the. I got the idea because I did one of those Facebook things where it picks up your, um, you know, the the words that you use the most. And right. Samson and Roselle were both in there. That's what gave me the idea. It's partially because I'm now. Yeah, Roselle's like, <laughs> wait a minute, what are you talking? <laughs> it's because I like promote stuff. Of, stuff a lot so I think I would have been doing a lot like tagging you a lot because I promote the po the podcast and I'm just a huge admirer of Samson and I promote him a lot as much as I can I think he's just well, so definitely, important definitely yes. we need to you know let him know what day he can choose yeah. He can choose, and I'll make I'll make a way for that day to happen if he can't do Tuesday. Okay. Oh, okay. I will. Yeah, that I would will. Be, that would be cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Because he, he said he really wants to do it as soon as he as soon as he has a Tuesday free. Okay. Like he's ah damn. I guess he's pretty. He must be. He yeah. must be busy. Okay. Well, like, let him know he has Monday and Wednesdays too. Okay. We can we can schedule a day and, and switch. I can okay. switch out with somebody else and do a Tuesday for someone else and then do a Wednesday if it's easier for him. Okay, cool. Matt Samson has some stories. Oh my god, he's been on the comedy circuit circuit for twenty years. Wow. And, um, yeah, he has a lot of stories of people he of people he's met. But yeah, I've learned a lot from him. So okay, so that's something we've learned from Mr. Samson and. Um, <clears throat> Samson will be here as soon as, as soon as we can get him. But um, what about? I mean, the issue about okay, how do we speak about the dead? And I don't know. I mean, it's interesting when somebody dies like that. You get to do you get to do a lot of retrospective and all that. And with the with somebody like Hefner, um, I'm still gonna take the attitude of. You know, there's a whole lot of women that, you know, have good have good things good things to say about him, and I accept what they say. I'm not gonna come along and say like, oh, I know, you know, that's one that's one of the things. Okay, you can't like tell somebody, oh, you're being exploited. Okay, people, right. you need, you know, hey, they need, if, you know, you can talk to people and let them know that they're support. So. Yeah, so that there were some interesting discussions about that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we got the comedy circuit and all that. Okay, so um, another really interesting person is John Abbott, who founded who founded the Defender, and this is a really awesome book about about the Defender, and he had a background. Um, he went to the Chicago World's Fair, I think, in eighteen in eighteen ninety-five, and <clears throat> um, decided to start a black news a black newspaper. Then, and one of the things you see, I think that's cool. He always said he didn't say you know Negro colored or whatever. He said the race, so capital. I think that's I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> he started the Defender, the magazine, a, a newspaper in um, Chicago, and just he would just go. I mean, it was he would just go out sell. I mean, he just completely financed it, financed it himself somehow for a, for a few years. But 
um, one of the things that was so fascinating to me was that the newspaper was distributed very much through the trains, through the and because there were so many um, African American men worked on worked on trains, and so that was one of the first unions. Was well, it was you know the African American unions was the Brotherhood of the sleeping of the sleeping car porters. So the porters would make money selling subscriptions. And selling and selling the new and selling the newspapers, and they would also gather stories to send back for material for material for the news for the newspaper. There were people all over the country that um, would subscribe to the Defender, and if people wanted to have like paper routes. Um, saying, um, Abbott would let them have papers on credit. And it was just amazing to me to see how important the defend the defender was was to people. Nice. And, <clears throat> and Abbott was an interesting was, was an interesting guy. He got really really rich somehow. I mean, even though you know the paper had like um, you know prob had problems, and so that's sort of the undercurrent there. It was like, oh, this was this was Chicago. Like, hey, good job, Mr. Abbott. Okay, yeah, right. um, and. Yeah, he he um, he traveled and okay. I didn't know this. Okay, Miss, at the time, um, yeah, Mr. Abbott was very dark skinned, and at the time, I had no idea what how formalized the distinctions were between people with dark skin and people with light skin. I mean, like. Formalized, they. I mean, um, I'm trying to think of some of the like people not being allowed to like marry each other and stuff because of wow. skin color, because of skin, because of complexion, wow. and um, he was not like he was a um, musician, but he wasn't yeah. allowed to be in a I'm certain. Bad. He wasn't allowed to be in a certain choir because he was dark skinned. So. That yeah, so I had no idea that that I mean you know I'm certainly familiar with issues and stuff about that, but I mean people had like step just step it was like total segregation within segregation, yeah, yeah. So and then so Mr. Abbott married a very light skinned woman, and so he would just sort of really enjoy like countering that with people and then um he would send her to would they would to go buy tickets for their trips so that it would so that they'd be first class and all that and so then they you know because she would get the tickets because she people would think she was white right, right. and so then they then they'd go on their on their trips together but yeah he was a he was an interesting fellow. He helped um, bring down um, people. Okay, now I should get like more background information on Mark on Marcus on Marcus Garvey. Um, but anyway, um, <clears throat> I need to come up with a. I need to. I, you know, he's like one of these people where I know who he is. You hear about him and all that, but. Um, Come on, can you say anything about Marcus Garvey? No. <laughs> okay. Um, you you look real knowledgeable. <laughs> you no, look real I, knowledgeable I, yeah, there. I had to sit there for a you know you know what I was thinking. Huh. You know, this is totally off the subject, but I was thinking of how it's historians and people who are into gathering information. I like how when they don't really know something, they say they don't know. Yeah. Most people, you know how some people. Yeah. Try to you know just try to let me just say it bull bullshit. Yeah, people, but historians, it's it's good. Historians just seem to, you know, if they don't know it, like you just did, just like I don't know too much about Marcus Garvey, so I'll just, yeah, you know, refrain from it. Yeah, he was, um, well, he really was spiritual, myst mystical, um, sort of leader with also, um, you know, some possibilities of some, you know, financial schemes and stuff like that, you know, and you never know with somebody like that because the government's going to, like, try and put put that on him. But 
Abbott participated in the government and FBI shaking down Marcus Garvey and wow. he did it in order to get J. Edgar Hoover off of his back. So Man, just man, that's just crazy. Isn't it? And it's just it's so complicated. It's the sort of questions I I really like it to think about. It just seemed like it was kinda of cutthroat. Like people, everybody yes. was just Technically, when it came down to it, it was just cutthroat. Like, you know, I'm not going to get in trouble for it, so I'm going to get get put it on them and, you know, have them going after them. Yeah. It's just, man, it's just crazy. Yeah. And he was, ma- and, you know, I mean, the thing, I am, you know, I'm, you know, he was doing this incredible newspaper. He was writing about things. He was getting people to write about things that weren't be, that weren't being written about. And it was a matter of extreme um, pride to him when the Defender was able to get their own printing presses. Right, because right. Um, before they would have to send them to print shops um, to like white companies. And so when they were able to get their own printing, printing plate, printing presses and, you know, have it all, you know, like basically it was their own thing. Right, right. And it, it's cool to think of how media, I mean, just how much independence people had. And, we, and um, so, yeah, we talked about that. There's just all sorts of stories about the Defender reporters going down. I mean, they'd go down to Jim Crow to cover trials and lynchings and all that, and then they'd be risking their lives just to report. Right, right. So, I mean, that's what, that's what, Abbott, what Abbott was doing, I mean, you know, and so, yeah, it wasn't, but yeah, he was pretty, he was pretty cutthroat, but you had to be, you have to be. You have to be, sometimes. you have to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, so that's Abbott. Um, okay, what were we going to, okay, so the, okay, so the issue about what do you know, what do you know about, um, Okay, so I've been having a discussion with somebody. Um, some of you guys know. Um, I think saying I think closeted is an insult, and I don't like um, people, historical people, being called closeted without us really knowing more about them. And I think it's 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 like you're. You're saying how somebody feels on the inside. You can talk about somebody being out or not out. That's objective, somewhat. I, 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 I mean, that, that is objective. So right. that is how I, because that way you're talking about somebody's choices. And so, like somebody said to me, like, oh, well, you shouldn't, you know, don't apply your principles and judge them. And I'm like, I'm defending them. I think it's, I, I don't think we should be saying they were closeted. I think that's an insult. And so I work on a, um, a project involving um, Doug, Doug Hammarskjöld, and one of my interests is to highlight that he had a lot, he had a lot of interests, and he had a very full life. And so people, a lot of the time, will talk about Mr. Hammarskjöld having something missing just because he was never married. And so um, I, and I was talking with a friend of mine, like, okay, how far do we go um, to be, you know, to say that we know this about somebody? And so with Mr. Hammarskjöld, um, I feel like I have enough biographical information about um, how much time he spent doing things, um, how many friends and family members he had, and that he told somebody that he wasn't gay. And I feel like we should take him at his word and that we shouldn't, um, and there's, that's, a, it's an attitude that there's something wrong with somebody because they're not married. Uh, so, um, he's an example of somebody that I feel that way about. Okay, and then Sam, Congressman Sam Rayburn was, you know, another fascinating person who um, who was described as a lonely person. It's like, okay, I get it because there's 
information about him that he spent a whole lot of time by himself and that he wasn't very comfortable with people. Right. And so in that circumstance, I feel like, yeah, you know, he was never married or with anybody. I, I feel like in that situation, um, you know, I mean, I think it's possible that he may have been secret, secretly gay or like not out or like, um, you know, because he has all, all that time on us. You know, it's like, but... I mean, I feel like we have enough information about Doug Hammarskjöld to accept who he said he was. Wow. Okay. Right on. Right on. Very much right on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um. So back to you. So just so everybody know, the, all the new listeners and the people who have never heard of you. Yeah. Who are you exactly? And explain what you do. Okay. My name is Anna Bergman. Um, I'm an, I was, I'm an archivist. I was, that's, um, I did a career thing several, several years ago. And that isn't being a historian and it's not being a librarian. It's, um, collect, it's, collecting information information and there's digital archiving which is a, which is a separate thing it's going and finding letters and anything you know anything can be valuable um, with the um, Autobi with the biography of Malcolm X by Manning Marable, which I talk about a lot they reconstructed the last two years of his life uh -huh. And they did it through archiving. So that'll be things like a ticket stub or right. a receipt. And so for that kind of work, you are going to be like going like reimbursements. You're going to be looking at financial stuff or, or just any record of what people were doing. So that's what archiving is. So like what, what got you into actually deciding to do archiving? I mean, what, what brought you to it? Like what was the feeling that made you say, like, man, I want to be an archivist, you know, I want to be a historian. <laughs> um, I was actually, I had some, uh, I was in a vocational vocational program, and they did, like, t testing and found that, found that, and found that for me. And, uh, you know, and this was crazy, because, you know, they, they do tests, and it was a good corroboration for me, like, okay, for me, like, okay, I didn't really know what it was, and then... It's just ridiculous to try and get a job doing it. There's so few jobs, and archivists get people that have the jobs are pretty possessive. Right. Um, so, um, I got to just be really passionate about finding things out, finding out records of people, and so it's not. It's also doing oral histories. It's also documenting yeah. things and. So I'm just, I feel really dedicated toward finding, finding stuff out, bringing history right. out. Um, and I, so, <clears throat> it took me a while to consider myself a historian. It's, I feel like it's a kind of a big title, um, but I just started, I just had read enough and thought enough that I was just coming up with my own ideas and putting the information together and so right. and um, I'm actually I just connected with somebody this was really exciting who edited Bayard Rustin's letters and I was um, talking with some other people about Bayard Rustin's archives and I want to go I, I never thought I would write a book ever I mean, I just didn't think I had the attention span or, or anything. And I felt like being an archivist for me is really rewarding because it's like helping other, you know, it's like you sort of find stuff and then other people put it together. Yeah. Um, but um, I communic I was in communication, um, you know, with the person that edited his letters, and he said there's a lot more material, Byards, that hasn't even been processed. And that's the thing about archiving. There's just so much stuff out there that hasn't been processed that nobody's looked at. And I feel very, it's very real to me. I feel like, well, you, so when you're archiving, you go through and sort of 
you get finding aids. It's like you tell people what's there. And <clears throat> uh, so somebody working on a biography can get that information. And um, so it feels a bit, I mean, it's very real to me to think that I could find something that would be useful to somebody's, to somebody's research. Nice. Um, I, I went through, uh, my father's a professor, so he had, um, he has archives at the, at the university, and I went through his correspondence to my grandparents mm -hmm. and found any mentions of his career, and so I went through those and keyword and got finding aids and gave to go in his university collection. And that's what you have to do. Right. You need to just go out and find your pro find your projects. And so when my grandmother saved everything and I may and this is the sort of thing which a lot of archivists would be horrified at me doing this. I didn't I got rid of my dad's report cards and his baby books. Oh, <laughs> Anna, you know you're supposed to keep all that. I know, but, it, you know, the thing is, I got stuck. It's like, if you are the person in the family that gets stuck with all that stuff, you just got to make some decisions. Right. And uh, so, and my dad didn't, he didn't want, he does not, I mean, he's an interesting person. People may very well write about him, but he doesn't like that idea. He did not, he didn't want a personal archive in the first, he, he wouldn't have wanted that. He wouldn't have wanted you to do that? You don't um, think? I, no. No, he, would, he wouldn't have. But more to the point, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done it, have done it. Right. I mean, you know, so I was, so out of all this paperwork, I think there's about 20 letters having to do with his career that are in there. And I just feel like somebody could be, it's not... And I've explained this to my family. It's usually, it's not so much necessarily that somebody will want to be working on something about him. He worked with a lot of famous uh, uh, people. So somebody can be researching right. them. And that's the really, the thing to me about archiving, which is so interesting. It's, it's usually not, you know, most, of, it's usually not the person that you're, talking that you're right in front of it's the connections the connections right yeah yeah so that's archiving um but yeah now i'm really interested in going and working and working with byard's uh, material and because biographies build on each other there's a really great biography of byard that was really influential to me that came out several several years ago Mm -hmm. And so there's more information that has come out since then. Right, you know, There's right, always right. more stuff being found. And, you know, certainly there's... Um, <laughs> I am so not interested in FBI documents and all that. So so you don't, you don't really feel the FBI document part of the situation, like when it comes to different people or... I, it's something that I... I mean, it's... It's a big part of research for people now is, is freedom of information requests. And right. I know some of that, of course, would have been done done for Bayard because, of course, they were watching his ass. Right. Um, and that's the sort of thing that changes with the laws. So, like, if I was going to do a biography of him, there would be the possible – I'd probably, like, want to check and see if there was anything more. So, so tell me this right now, Anna. Hmm. If the FBI agency just opened up the doors right now and said, man, you can go through all <laughs> the historical yeah. facts and, you know, information they have, would you do it? They um, let you do it now. Now, you wouldn't get in trouble now. They just said, go ahead. You can look up anybody you want. Would you do it? Or would you kind of just want to leave it alone? I would want to do something else. It, it's just, it's not interesting to me because you you'll find out you find, you know, because if you know what the people were doing, I mean, I would be interested in finding more of Bayard's correspondence, finding out more of things about what he did and people he knew and all that. And, you know, you sort of figure that, like, with the FBI, they would have been, you know, they were monitoring, if they're monitoring people, you're going to have some of the same information yourself. Right, that you already have. Yeah, so... No, not no, not really. 
Now, I was going to ask you a question. I remember you invited me to see a movie, what was that, a month ago, a month or two ago? Mm-hmm. What was the name of that movie again? Um, well, you went to one of the ones I invited you. I went to one of them. Upstairs Inferno, yeah. Upstairs Inferno. Yeah. Now, can you, I kind of enjoyed it. I was, like, shocked about the movie because I didn't understand. And, you know, when you first told me about it, I was like, man, this is going to be kind of weird. You yeah. Know? And then when I saw it, I was like, oh, I get it now. So I just wanted to kind of, can you explain that to people? And I, also another question I had with it was, is it going to be touring? Are they showing it in different cities and states? Or how is that working? Um, okay, so, non- what was the... Oh, the other movie I think I was telling you about was about um, Aaron Dixon. It was about a Black Panther. Uh-huh. And I think that was the other one I mentioned. That was that was a cool documentary, too. Nice, um, nice. Okay, so, well, Upstairs Inferno was, do you want the, what, what's the question about it? Or Like, is it is it going to be touring? Is it going to be, like, in other states, or are they touring it now? Can you um, see it anywhere? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to bring it. I want to bring it back. Uh-huh. I'm not sure where it's playing right. Where it's <coughs> playing right now. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely. I mean, I I be post. I I follow it on. I follow it on fa- on Facebook. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, I def- I want to do it again. I I screened it in the summer in the summertime, and it was. I I just wanted. To, it was the first time I'd screened a film, and I wanted to just see how it went and. So it was a smaller group of people, which was fine with me. Nice. I mean, I've been doing events for a long time, and I've really just removed from my mind making it be about how many people show up. Right, I'm glad right. to, you know, because to me it's like that means you're not, if you think that way, then you're not appreciating the people that are there. Right. Did it, did it wind up getting more people coming to the other showings? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it still wasn't that many. It's. I mean, it was. Um, the, it was the middle of summer. A lot yeah. of there was a lot of people that wanted to see it, and were doing other things. Right. Um, so I. Yeah, I do want to bring it. Want to bring it back. But um, now I'm working on um, screening the documentary about Bayard Rustin. Yeah. That's that's what we're doing on. And you actually have a, a page for it on Facebook, I right? Do. What do you, what's the name of the page? Um, Bayard Rustin Day. Oh, okay. Right, right on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got plans um, for that. But yeah, I do want to, um, and we're actually raising raising some money for um, Brother Outsider to okay. do the, um, you know, to screen it. Yeah, so I do want to do it again. Um, I'd have to figure out. Um, I'd like to screen Upstairs Inferno again. I would right. um, have to figure out the money. Do it. Nice, nice.